we can be open the book of Mark chapter 15. Several of the Brother Adam's points reminded me of what I had prepared for Sunday school, so we'll get a reminder again next week, I guess. But the summary of it is that God should get the glory ultimately. Amen. One thing that he brought out about the sparrows that over in Matthew, when Christ tells this, Matthew chapter 10, verse see, 29, says, There are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. A lot of people quote that as without your father knowing, but God doesn't just know when the sparrows fall. I think he even appoints when they fall to the ground. Amen. And that should give us even more comfort that when afflictions come, God doesn't just know about them. He is, in a sense, the author of them. That he is not just, he's more than just able to get us through them. But if we trust in him, he will get us through those things. That's why he tells us to fear not, for we are many, much more value than many sparrows. Yeah. Let's go to Mark chapter 15. Uh, no doubt, a, probably a familiar passage. I know I've preached from it before, but I'd like us just to think about the crucifixion this morning. Matthew, or excuse me, Mark chapter 15, verse 25. If you're familiar with the context here, Christ had been arrested and tried and beaten and led up to Golgotha or Calvary, as Luke calls it. In verse 25, it says, And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Have we ever really stopped to think about just those words there? They crucified him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we do thank thee for this privilege and opportunity we have together with thy people here today, Lord, and worship thee. I pray that now we would put worldly thoughts aside and focus on the message, Lord. I thank thee for the Sunday school hour and the songs that we sang, Lord. I pray that thou would get all the glory and honor of everything we say and do here. We pray for Brother Larry and Brother Katrine is there, not here, if you might help him up, Lord, that you might. Have your little way, even in such a thing as that, Lord. We thank thee for all your blessings you bestow upon us, all your goodness that you give to us each and every day, Lord. Truly, thou art much better to us than we deserve. But we thank thee especially for Christ and his sacrifice. Let's pray that you might even save a lost soul here today, Lord. Bless us that goes out over the internet as well. We pray that you might use that to. Plant the good seed, Lord, that you might save souls through it as well. And it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we ask all these things. Amen. Yeah. Now here, we have a very simple verse, and it says, and it was the third hour, or about nine o'clock in the morning, and they crucified him. First we see, who did they crucify? We know it was Jesus, <coughs> but just think about who he is, who is as a person, he is the Christ, the Messiah, the chosen one, who will the Savior, the Son of God, God the Son. He is the Lord of glory, as it, Paul calls him in 1 Corinthians 2 8. Speaking of the mysteries of God, he said, If the princes of this world had knew it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. No, he is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Almighty. He, is that which is to come, that which was, that which shall ever be? Amen. He's the one that Revelation called him, he that liveth and was dead and is alive forevermore. Mm -hmm. And yet, he was all this, and man crucified him. Well, uh, this, there's a story, I don't know if it's true or not, that an atheist once asked, well, why doesn't God come down and show himself if he's real? And they, the response was, well, he did, and they crucified him. I believe it would be no different today 
We don't practice crucifixion in America, but it would not be received if he was alive today. <clears throat> I think it's John chapter 1 that says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Right. I'd say by and large, many professing Christians wouldn't even welcome him if he was walking on earth today. Well, he was a man rejected, a man of sorrow, as the scripture calls him, the stone that the builders refused. The man naturally did not receive Christ. And we see in all full display here when they, they crucify him, they put him to death. We know this had to happen, but it displays the depravity of man that they would crucify the very Lord and Savior. <laughs> they wouldn't, man in his own depraved nature does not want to receive God, he wants to reject God. And we see it very literally here. And man literally puts him on the cross, tries to eradicate the very idea of the Savior. Yeah. But so many today, they, they reject him in thought and in deed, and even many that profess his name reject him in the way in which they live. Now, certainly we can't re-crucify Christ, but we certainly aren't openly accepting of him as we ought to be. It says they crucified him. Now, why did they crucify him besides the, the fact they were depraved and they rejected him? We know it had to be for them. He would pay the penalty for our sins. Right. He was tempted in all points like we were, but yet without sin, Hebrews says. Yeah. So even, even though he lived in a body of flesh, it was not a sinful body of flesh. Even though he appeared like a man. He was not like man in that sense. Yet he came and lived among ungodly men, yet that sin did not affect him in the way that it affects us. When we live among the ungodly and we are oftentimes negatively impacted by it, aren't we? We see that in the life of Lot. He had no testimony. He was really unaffected by the sin which was around him. And yet Christ, he lived among the wicked and sinful, and he was affected by it. He had compassion over and over again on those. Yet in all these things, he was without sin. Have you ever considered that bleeding, dying lamb of God on the cross and realized it was your sins that placed him there, that ought to be a humbling thought if you're a child of God, that your sins are what placed him there, that it was, I think personally it was my sin that placed him there, so the junior, you're saved, I believe, it was your sins that placed him there, or Adam, you say that to the whole room here, that ought to break our hearts that our sin placed him there upon the cross. And we ought not to think lightly of sin because it was sin that slew our Savior. Yeah. And yet, I think too many times we don't think upon the crucifixion like we ought to. We don't think upon what Christ did on our behalf like we should. Well, 1 Corinthians 15, let me turn over there. For just a moment, 1 Corinthians 15. Here we're given really a summary of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3 and 4. It says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture. He knows that he says it wasn't for anything that he had done, was it? When Pilate tried him, he said, I find no fault in the man. All right. <coughs> it was for our sins that he died. 
It was for the transgressions of the law that we did, not anything that he had done. You see that bore out over and over throughout the scriptures that he died for our sins. Galatians chapter 1 tells us that he gave himself for our sins. Titus chapter 2 tells us that he gave himself for us. Turn over there, Titus chapter 2. chapter 2 and verse number 14 says who speaking of Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify himself of peculiar people zealous of good works and Christ gave himself he says for us that he would redeem us or buy us back from iniquity from you notice he says from all iniquity it wasn't like Christ paid some of it and we gotta pay the rest notice Truly that song is correct when it says Jesus paid it all. And he gave himself completely for us, for our sins, that he might pay that debt which we couldn't pay. And he says, and purify himself with peculiar people's else of good works. But not only did he just pay for our sins, but he also made us anew that we could serve him, as he says here, that we might be a peculiar people, and we might be zealous of good works. You know, I have a hard time believing these people who say they've been born again, yet they still live just like they always did. Yeah. Yeah. But if the grace that saves you doesn't change you, then perhaps you don't know what biblical grace really is. Yeah. Well, Christ gave himself for our sins. Isaiah 53 bears that out over and over again. It was that for our transgressions, it was for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Then he goes on to say, by his stripes, we are healed. Just think and consider how that it was our sin that placed him there and that ought to really break our hearts if we're truly been born again. It ought to cause us to abhor that which is evil, as Romans 12 tells us. It ought to give us the same mindset that Joseph had when he said, how shall I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? But oftentimes we're, we think too lightly of sin. Really when we do that, we think too lightly of what Christ has done for us. Oh, it says they, they crucified him. They crucified our very Savior. But it wasn't for any wrong that he had done. It was for the wrong which we had done. Going back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we continue on to verse 4. It says, And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scripture. And Christ... He didn't stay on the cross, that he didn't stay dead. Uh, that's why I have an issue with these pictures and sculptures of Christ on the cross, supposedly Christ on the cross. Because <coughs> Christ did not stay there. He didn't stay in the grave either. No, he was buried and rose again. <coughs> that he might defeat death completely, that, he, that we through him might have victory over death. Unlike all the rest of the quote founders of religions in this world, ours is the only one that's not in a grave somewhere. Well, Muhammad, he's buried somewhere in the Middle East. Uh, Buddha, he's over there in Asia somewhere. Gandhi he had some good ideas, but he didn't know the way of salvation, and yet he is buried over there as well. Countless others we could go through. And yet, only Christ is risen and alive forevermore. Only Christ died for sin and then defeated death itself by rising in the third day. 
for how we ought to really give him the praise that he would die for us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans tells us. And it wasn't while that he thought we were good people and thought, well, I'm not going to save them. No, but while we were at enmity with us, with him, I mean, if Christ died for us, well, yeah. really we were anything but desirable, and yet Christ died for us. We were really transgressors of his law. We were breakers of his commandments. Right. We certainly didn't deserve salvation in any sort, and yet Christ died for us. They crucified our God, but it was really for our sins which he was crucified. Just to think of all the suffering that he did for us, and then that he would die for us. It ought to be a humbling thought for the child of God. If we go back to Matthew chapter 26, Matthew's account of the crucifixion. We can see some of the things that he endured for us. In verse 65, as he was before the, the high priest, it says, Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witness? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy, what think you? They answered and said he was guilty of death. Then they did spit in his face and buffeted him or slapped him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? And Luke's gospel says that they blindfolded him as well. They mocked him and they phoned him, they spit on him, they slapped him. And he goes on to say that that they put that crown of thorns upon his head. Go on to chapter 27. Verse number 27 of chapter 27 says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus in the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had played a crown of thorns, they put upon his head and a reed in his hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Again, they mocking our Lord. They weren't uh. truly worshiping him. They, well, yeah, you're really a king, all right, they were saying. Can't imagine that, that even just the crown of thorns was being placed and pressed upon his head. And then verse 30 goes on to say, They spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to be crucified, or led him away to crucify him. Well, after he had been beaten and mocked and slapped and about he was weak physically. It says in verse 32, and as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. I think Christ was too physically worn down to even carry the cross on his own. I think it's been pointed out before that a lot of times people didn't even survive the, the beatings that were. <coughs> Yet our Christ did not say, you know, he did not command that legion of angels to come down and destroy his enemies. Well, I know he had the power to, but I know he, in other sense, he couldn't. The scriptures had to be fulfilled. Yet, for his great love towards us, he endured such things. Romans, I mean, excuse me, Hebrews says that for the joy that was set before me, that endured the cross, despising the shame, yeah. that he might redeem unto himself a people. That is why he endured 
such great suffering, such great difficulties. If we go on and here in Matthew it says in verse 33, when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, cast in lots, and it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. That comes from Psalm 22. They would take his garments off of them and it says cast lots for them. They parted of each one. So here we have just really put to an open shame, if you will. Naked and hanging on a cross and suffering for you and I, and yet oftentimes we take such things for granted, don't we? And then even those that were crucified with him, they mocked him. We know the, the one would eventually be saved, but yet at the beginning he mocked him as well and said, Thou be the Christ, save yourself and us. In another place they said, Well, if, if thou be the Christ, come down. Here, let's go down to verse 41 or 40. It says, And saying, it says they pass by and wag their heads. It says, Thou that destroys the temple and builds it up in three days, save thyself. Thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. There they are, tempting and mocking him once again. Well, if you're really the Son of God, just come down from there. Yeah. I think whether it's in Mark or Luke that says, Well, if you come down, we'll believe you. Actually, it's in verse 42 here. Going on, it says, Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him. With the scribes and others said, He saved others himself, he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down now, or let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. You know, they wouldn't believe him if he came down. But I always kind of like the example that Christ gave of John the Baptist and himself. He said, John came, neither eating nor drinking, and he said, He had the devil. Yeah. Son of man has come eating and drinking, and you call him. A wine bibber and friend of sinners and a gluttonous man. So they would have made some excuse not to believe him, even if he did come down. That's really the nature of man, isn't it? To find some excuse not to believe in God. Verse 43 says, He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also, which were cast, or which crucified with them, cast the same in his teeth. So he said, He saved others, he himself he cannot save. Really, that was blasphemy, was it not? That Christ could not save himself? He could if he certainly had the power to, if I could say it that way. And certainly he did save others. I don't know, they doubted even that. <laughs> The world will doubt that you have what we call salvation today. They, they don't believe that there is such a thing as eternal life. There is a heaven or a hell. Man, by and large, rejects such ideas. Yeah, you can be sure if you're trusting in Christ, if you believed on him, that he has saved you. But if you don't believe on him, John chapter 3 says you're already in the condemnation. That you're already condemned in his sight. That was verse 45 and 46. My, my thinking is probably the worst suffering for Christ on the cross was here. It says, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the earth, over all the land to the ninth hour. And God himself, God the Father, had turned his back, if you will, on Christ. It wasn't an eclipse, it wasn't a cloudy day. I think it was as dark as midnight throughout the middle of the day here, from the ninth hour, which was 12 o'clock, or excuse me, three o'clock, to from six hour to the ninth hour, so from about 12 o'clock to three o'clock, there was darkness, it says, over all the land. 
Yeah. Like I said, it wasn't just a cloudy day, it wasn't just an eclipse that lasted for a while. The whole, the whole really the presence of God, you know, had been turned away from that place. Verse 46 says, At about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, long lost the back than I. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he had been left alone there to do, endure our sins. And he could not, at that point, cry out to God, and God would deliver him, for he had to endure our sins. He had to endure such a thing. We really had to endure separation from the Father so that we won't have to. Yet for all the unsaved, that's what they will experience for all eternity, a separation from God. And that lake of fire which burns with brimstone day and night forever and ever, that is the end state of all the wicked. Yes, it ought to cause us to sorrow over those that don't know Christ. And we should never be <coughs> thrilled about the death of the one that doesn't know the Savior. Yeah. Now certainly God gets the glory even out of that. If we can praise him that he gets, that he judges sin, that he will one day destroy sin. But it should not thrill our hearts to see one that we love die in their sins. Christ said, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. He didn't say if you're not a good person. He didn't say if you haven't been baptized. He didn't say any of these other schemes which man has come up with. But simply believe on him and thou shalt be saved. But if not, you shall die in your sins. Christ preached to repent and believe on him. He said, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. We, in that context, in that scripture, he, he's pointing out that there's really no sinners above other sinners. There's no more wicked men than, like I am not any more wicked than the most wicked of men, the most wicked of men are not any more wicked than I am. He says, suppose ye that these were sinners above the rest, and that's when he said, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Man. Just because you're a, quote, good person doesn't mean you'll be free from the penalty of sin. Just because, you know, you go to church every Sunday doesn't mean that God's going to, quote, accept you. Man. It's really only through Christ that we can be accepted. The boy goes on to show the ignorance of those that were around the crucifixion because they thought he cried out for Elias and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it was really all that Christ would suffer, all that Christ would do was already written before time in the scriptures. All those things were pointed to him, yet they could not see it. Really, it's no different today that we have the scriptures and the word of God and we, we go out and preach and accept man's heart be open, accept his mind be enlightened, he will never receive it. Yeah. Just as uh, Brother Adam was teaching in Sunday school, we can plant, we can water, but it must be God that gives the increase. Yeah. We cannot boast that we have saved any souls, for we cannot save a single soul. You know, I like, I think it was Augustine that said, man cannot can even cure himself of a toothache, much less save his own soul. Yeah. But yet, many today are trusting in themselves and what they have done, or maybe what some other man has done. Do I simply need to trust in Christ and what he did? What he accomplished, not only on the cross, but also three days later when he rose from the grave. Well, let's go back to First uh, Corinthians 15, and we'll 
draw us to a close here. First Corinthians 15, we began the chapter with the, the gospel, if you will, that how that Christ died for our sins and how that he rose <laughs> again the third day. The chapter goes on to talk about how that without the resurrection we'd be of all men most miserable, though that Christ is the, the first fruits of those which sleep. And he said, without the resurrection, verse 18, he says, then they also which are fallen asleep, or those which have died in Christ, are perished. <laughs> and you can't believe the gospel without believing that Christ also rose from the dead. Yeah. In fact, Romans 10 says that we must believe in the heart of it. I'm going to turn over there I can't wait for the Romans chapter 10. Verse number 9 says, that, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So it can't just be that Christ died, but Christ also had a rise again. Just think about all that Christ did on our behalf is a really overwhelming thought, isn't it? And then if you think about all he does for you in your day-to-day -day life, it's just about as much overwhelming. And then I'd like us to look at what awaits for us. First Corinthians 15 again. Going down to verse 50, he, he begins to tell us how that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But he says in verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that the flesh and Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit new corruption. So this body cannot go to heaven. You know, this body cannot stand in the presence of God. And neither really can any that are in the flesh. None that have been ever have never been born again. They're still corrupt in nature. They cannot be in the presence of God, other than to be judged and cast in the lake of fire. Verse 51 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised, and the we shall be changed. He said, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We shall not all be <laughs> dead in Christ, if you will, right. but every last one of us are going to be changed. Every last one of us will drop this sinful body of flesh and put on one like unto his perfect body. In fact, the things in Galatians says, he shall change our vile body and one like unto his glorious body. We go on to verse 53. It says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. Just think of that. It's all kind of hard to comprehend in this finite mind of ours that We'll have an incorruptible body, an immortal body, when it's not affected by sin and the effects of sin. No, we won't need these glasses anymore. We won't need to take our medicine anymore. We won't have to deal with the elements of this world and aging and all the pain that goes along with it. Yeah. And that curse is completely gone. Yeah. That's kind of difficult to comprehend in this flesh. <laughs> Yet that is the reality for all those that have been born again. Verse 54 goes on to say, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought past the same that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a victory over death in the person of Christ. Really, it has no hold on us now, but when we get that perfect body, it will be vanished forever. Won't be any casket makers or grave diggers in eternity. 
There won't be any need for funerals and such there, yet we shall be ever with the Lord, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians. That forever with the Lord is a, another concept that's hard to grasp in this mind, but yet it ought to thrill our hearts that we shall be forever with Him. It is not just going to be a thousand years or ten thousand years or a million years or Forever. throughout the endless ages. Mm -hmm. you know, there is a, a bluegrass gospel song that says a million years in glory with a million more to go. But even that cannot compare to eternity with Christ. But if you don't know Christ as your Savior, the exact opposite of this awaits you. It's not eternity in the presence of God. It's not eternity in the perfect sinless body that's free from even the curse of sin. Really to an eternity of suffering for you for your own sins. Let's go over to Revelation chapter 20. All right. So for any of us that go to heaven it will be completely on the merit of Christ. For any of you that go to hell will be will be completely on your own merits. Spurgeon said something along the lines of God looked down upon Christ and saw our sins upon him and yet he spared him not. And so when he looks upon the unregenerate without Christ and there will he spare them. It ought to be a, really a sobering thought if you've never been born again that God's not going to spare you. He's not going to have mercy and grace upon you when you stand before him. If you're not in Christ, if you've never been born again. So Revelation 20, I know it's a familiar passage, but beginning in verse 11, it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw a dead, small, and great stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell were delivered up. Or two, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So many people want to be judged by their works, and yet they will be one day. But they'll find that their works are very lacking. And verse 14 goes on to say, death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And here we see death is completely destroyed for all eternity. Verse 15 says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Notice he didn't say, and, and all the good people, they weren't cast in the lake of fire, did he? He didn't say, and all the church members, or all the Baptists, or whatever qualifier you want to put on there. The only thing he says is all those that were not written in the land of life were cast in the lake of fire. Yeah. We ought to serve God. If we've been considering all that he had done for us, it should compel us to serve him. Don't ever trust in what you are doing. Your works can never save you. Your works cannot keep you saved. Well, is your name in the book of life? That is the main concern. Have you ever been born again? We could say, do you know Christ as Savior? We could, have you ever experienced the grace of God? We could use all these different phrases, but are you saved or are you lost? Are you in Christ or are you out of Christ? Whatever phrase you want to use, you get is your name in the book of life or not? That will make a difference when you stand before God. Notice back in verse 10, it says, And the devil that cast, or that see with them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone with a beast and false prophet are. And this last part here, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so it is for all those that are cast into the lake of fire. Verse 15. And you shall be tormented there day and night forever and ever. And man, says, well, that doesn't seem very fair. It doesn't seem like a very loving God. 
Well, that's really what sin deserves, isn't it? Yeah. To spend eternity suffering for that sin, and yet Christ suffered for that sin on our behalf. He endured really all of these things for us that we would not have to. And yet so often we take it for granted and we think too lightly of it. But when you don't know Christ, that will be your eternity. With his justice demands penalty for sin. He, he cannot be true to his own character and just wink it and gloss over sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, Hebrew says. In the Old Testament, it was the, the sacrifices that covered their sins for a time. And Christ was a perfect fulfillment of that, taking away sins for all of eternity. In fact, Hebrew says he obtained redemption for us. He didn't just make it possible. He didn't just throw it out there as an offer. He obtained redemption for his people. But if you don't know Christ, if you die in your sins, this is where you'll spend all of eternity. And that, I don't want to scare someone into making a profession of faith, but yet that is the reality of it. That, Hell and then the lake of fire awaits all those who die in their sins. And for us that are born again, that will drive us to tell them about the one that can save them. If we would truly realize what Christ has done for us, what Christ can do for the lost, how well, that ought to tell us to tell them about Christ over and over and over again. We can't shove it down their throats, we can't make them believe. We know how we ought to. Tell them about the one that can save them. We do them no justice if we don't tell the lost about Christ. As Ezekiel says, we are the watchmen, and if we don't warn people, their blood will be upon our hands. Death is coming, Christ is coming. Eternity awaits each and every one of us. Well, how we ought to be busy telling others about the one that can save them from me, from their sins. How we ought to be busy about telling others about the Christ that can pardon to them eternal life. Well, how we ought to praise him that he has saved us, that he has suffered for us, that he has died for us, that he has done so much for us and that still so much more awaits for us that we can't even comprehend in this flesh. It would cause us to complain a whole lot less, wouldn't it? If we consider, consider the glory which awaits us, we consider all that Christ did for us. But Paul said that if our reckon the sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared to the glory which will be revealed in us, we might have a, a hard time in this life if we're born again, but yet it's nothing compared to what Christ did for us and what awaits us in eternity. But just the opposite, that you might have the, your best life now, as some preach. You might have a good old time here on earth and doing, enjoying the pleasures of sin, but if you don't know Christ as your Savior, eternity in the lake of fire is what awaits you. It'll be far too late then. You, won't. You, know, you might be like the rich man and say, go tell the others that they might not come here. But it'll be far too late for you. Oh, how I just point you to Christ and that he, you would trust in what he has done. 